I'm delighted to be here at uh, Seattle's University Christian Church uh, addressing this gathering tonight. As you know, I'm sure uh, residents of Washington have a particularly close relationship to nuclear weapons. For the Hanford site, located on the uh, Columbia River and including nine nuclear uh, reactors and five massive uh, plutonium processing complexes, uh, produce most of the nuclear weapons in the U.S. government's arsenal. Consequently, Hanford is today the most contaminated nuclear site in the United States with uh, 53 million gallons of, of radioactive waste, about two-thirds of this nation's high-level radioactive waste. My talk tonight, How Peace Activists Saved the World from Nuclear War, is, as Jav mentioned, uh, based on a uh, trilogy I've written entitled The Struggle Against the Bomb. Uh, as well as on uh, uh, that much abbreviated version that he mentioned, uh, confronting the bomb. Uh, but on to the subject of uh, peace activists and the remarkable role they have played in preventing nuclear annihilation. What accounts for the fact that since 1945 the world has avoided nuclear war? After all, a, a nation that has developed nuclear weapons generally uses them in its wars. For example, Immediately after the U.S. government succeeded in building nuclear weapons, it used them to destroy Japanese cities. Furthermore, a nation that has devoted vast resources to developing nuclear weapons does not usually get rid of them, un at least until it develops more powerful weapons. But since August 1945, no nation has used nuclear weapons to attack another, and only a relatively small number of nations have chosen to build them. Also, those nations that have developed nuclear weapons have gravitated toward nuclear arms control and disarmament measures. A partial test ban treaty, uh, strategic arms limitation treaties, strategic arms reduction treaties, and a comprehensive test ban treaty. Why have they adopted these policies of nuclear restraint? The conventional explanation is that the danger posed by nuclear weapons has deterred uh, nations from waging nuclear war and overall has created a situation of nuclear safety. There has been in the um, eyes and minds of those uh, uh, promoting this theory, there has been peace through strength. But this explanation fails to account for some important developments. Since 1945, Nuclear powers have not waged nuclear war against non-nuclear powers. Who deterred them? Sometimes in their confrontation with non-nuclear powers, they have suffered military defeat rather than resort to nuclear war. Why? Moreover, if, if nuclear deterrence works, <clears throat> why bother with nuclear arms control and disarmament treaties? Why not simply build, test, and deploy nuclear weapons free of international constraints? These unanswered questions suggest that something is missing from the conventional explanation. I'm suggesting to you tonight that the missing ingredient is a massive grassroots movement, one that has mobilized millions of people and nations around the globe, the World Nuclear Disarmament Movement. And here's a, a picture of that movement in the, in the streets uh, in June of 1982 in New York City. To better uh, understand this, let us take a brief look at citizen activism for nuclear disarmament and then at its impact. Nuclear disarmament has been a continuous public concern since 1945 and remains a concern for millions of people and for numerous peace and disarmament organizations. But during the past half century, there have also been three great upsurges of public protest against the arms race, each larger than its predecessor and it is to these upsurges that we should pay particular attention. The atomic bombing of Hiroshima and Nagasaki sent a wave of public concern across the globe in the mid to late 1940s. Some persons, particularly those with strong moral convictions, were deeply troubled by this mass murder of civilians. Their critique of the atomic bombing was voiced by small pacifist organizations and by some major religious bodies. Many more people, though, feared that the development of nuclear weapons would lead to the destruction of the planet. Warning that the choice was one world or none, 
scientist groups and world government organizations sprang up around the globe. Uh, here's one such uh, speaker uh, rallying people uh, around the slogan of one world or none back in the 1940s. In Japan, the uh, survivors of the atomic bombing began to hold anti-nuclear gatherings, including Hiroshima Day commemoration ceremonies. And here's one in uh, Hiroshima. For the most part, the pacifists, the atomic scientists, the world government advocates, and the Japanese survivors worked together in an attempt to stimulate popular revulsion to nuclear war and public demands for nuclear arms controls. Although this first surge of citizen activism faded with the heightening of the Cold War, the escalation of the nuclear arms race, and particularly H-bomb tests, hydrogen bomb tests, triggered an even more vigorous upsurge of protest in the late 1950s and early 1960s. In a widely publicized appeal, Bertrand Russell and Albert Einstein warned of the prospect of nuclear annihilation. Other prominent intellectuals, such as Albert Schweitzer and Linus Pauling, soon followed their example. Um, through the Puckwash movement, developed by Russell and Joseph Rothblatt, uh, and here's uh, uh, Russell on your, on your left and Rothblatt on your right, through their pugwash movement, scientists on both sides of the Iron Curtain began a series of conferences on the nuclear <coughs> danger. Ban the bomb movement sprang up in numerous nations. The Campaign for Nuclear Disarmament, CND, in Britain, uh, Canada, Australia, and New Zealand. The National Committee for a Sane Nuclear Policy, SANE, and Women's Strike for Peace in the United States. Genswikyo and Genswiken in Japan the struggle against atomic death in West Germany, the movement against atomic armaments in France, and comparable movements in many Western and non-aligned countries. They distributed vast quantities of anti-nuclear literature, published chilling advertisements, and staged massive simultaneous protest marches under the nuclear disarmament symbol in dozens of nations. British CND's older Maston marches, at their height, drew as many as 150,000 people. Here they are in uh, Trafalgar Square. With or without uh, permission, these anti-nuclear agitators even held demonstrations in communist nations. Here's a group uh, of Western anti-nuclear activists moving into Red Square. Uh, in the Soviet Union, uh, courageous in individuals such as Andrei Sakharov also challenged uh, official nuclear policy. Meanwhile, opinion polls revealed overwhelming popular distaste for nuclear war and support for abolishing nuclear weapons. Starting in the mid-1960s and continuing into the mid-1970s, resistance to nuclear weapons declined dramatically. Exhausted by a, a decade of anti-nuclear struggle, some activists retreated into private life. Furthermore, like the general public, Many were convinced by the Partial Test Ban Treaty of 1963 and by growing Soviet-American detente that the era of nuclear crisis had come to an end. Finally, activists were drawn in the 1960s into the anti-Vietnam War movement and other avant-garde causes, such as women's liberation. As a result, nuclear disarmament organizations dwindled in size and changed their focus while nuclear issues ceased to receive much attention from the general public. Even so, the anti-nuclear struggle resumed in the late 1970s, when radioactive contamination from nuclear power plants renewed nuclear fears. The end of the Vietnam War freed peace groups to focus on the nuclear danger, and the Cold War reemerged. In this context, older anti-nuclear groups started to revive, and newer ones to appear. By 1980, U.S. peace groups were beginning to line up behind a, a nuclear freeze, an idea proposed by defense analyst Randy Forsberg. Meanwhile, West European groups, pulled together by an appeal for European nuclear disarmament, END, issued by E.P. Thompson, uh, a, a prominent British historian, were gearing up to oppose the deployment of a new generation of devastating Euro missiles, cruise and Pershing II missiles from NATO, and SS-20 missiles from the Soviet Union. 
This revival skyrocketed into mass protest after 1980, largely thanks to the advent of the hawkish Reagan administration with its loose talk of nuclear war. END was soon coordinating a huge anti-nuclear campaign throughout Europe. Groups like CND in Britain, the Interchurch Peace Council in the Netherlands, church organizations and the New Green Party in West Germany, and No uh, to Nuclear Weapons in Norway and Denmark, mushroomed into mass movements that held vast demonstrations. Anti-nuclear movements staged the largest protest rallies in the history of, of Japan, Australia, and New Zealand, while other Pacific Island nations drew together into a nuclear-free and independent Pacific movement. In the fall of 1983, an estimated five million people took part in anti-nuclear demonstrations. In, in most of these countries, the, the movement could mobilize strong support from religious bodies, uh, professional groups, unions, and social democratic parties. Even in the communist nations of East Germany, Hungary, Czechoslovakia, China, and the Soviet Union, independent nuclear disarmament groups emerged and publicly challenged official policy, despite the harassment and imprisonment of activists by the authorities. In the United States, mobilization for survival, physicians for social responsibility, and SANE grew rapidly. In June 1982, nearly a million Americans turned out for that uh, New York City march that I mentioned uh, against the nuclear arms race, the largest demonstration up to that point in, in U.S. history. And here's the beginning of the march, uh, surging through uh, New York City to Central Park, leading to this, this vast um, uh, rally. Meanwhile, the nuclear weapons freeze campaign designed to stop the nuclear arms race through a Soviet-American agreement to halt the testing, development, and deployment of nuclear weapons, drew the backing of most peace groups, major unions, and mainstream religious bodies. Despite attempts by the Reagan administration to discredit the freeze movement, polls found that it drew the support of 70 to 80 percent of the American public. In the fall of 1982, a majority of voters backed the freeze in nine of the ten states where it appeared on the ballot. In 1984, it was made part of the Democratic Party's presidential campaign platform. Although public protest against the bomb waned somewhat in, in, in the latter part of the 1980s, the movement retained substantial strength. Only in the 1990s, with the end of the Cold War, did it sharply decline. Now, is there evidence of a connection between these upsurges of mass protest and policies of nuclear restraint? There is, and it is available in abundance. It reveals that top government officials closely watched the nuclear disarmament movement, ordered numerous surveys of attitudes toward nuclear weapons, and were deeply shaken by what they found. Uh, though the leaders of the nuclear powers fought back with vast public relations campaigns, designed to spark popular support for nuclear weapons, or at least their nuclear weapons, and undermine their critics, such efforts came to naught. Ultimately, government officials found it necessary to compromise with an anti-nuclear public. In the late 1950s and early 1960s, numerous governments interested in building nuclear weapons but battered by waves of anti-nuclear protests decided reluctantly not to develop the bomb. They included the governments of West Germany, Sweden, and Switzerland. The Japanese government, perhaps the most shell-shocked by the popular protests, issued a proclamation of three non-nuclear principles, a refusal to manufacture, possess, or introduce nuclear weapons into Japan. The Canadian government moved to phase nuclear weapons out of its national defense program. In response to anti-nuclear agitation in, in, in later years, there were also important shifts in other lands. New Zealand banned visits of nuclear warships. Australia refused to test MX missiles. India halted work on nuclear weapons, and its new Prime Minister, Rajiv Gandhi, called for a nuclear-free world. The Philippines adopted a nuclear-free constitution and soon um, shut down U.S. military bases housing nuclear weapons. 
South Africa decided to scrap its nuclear weapons program. But you might be thinking to yourselves, nothing stopped the U.S. government from proceeding with the nuclear arms race. Or did it? Let's examine the record carefully. The Truman administration began with a very positive view of nuclear weapons and no plans for nuclear arms controls. Truman regarded the bomb as, quote, the greatest thing in history. And yet, within a short time, under intense public pressure, the president came round to authorizing the development of the Baruch Plan, the world's first serious nuclear disarmament proposal. Similarly, when the Eisenhower administration came to office in 1953, and here's a meeting of Eisenhower with his cabinet, it had no interest whatsoever in nuclear arms controls or disarmament. Instead, it was committed to responding to any form of communist aggression by launching a full-scale nuclear war, what it called massive retaliation, as well as to integrating nuclear weapons into conventional war. Nuclear weapons, President Eisenhower declared publicly, should, quote, be used just exactly as you would use a bullet or anything else. But H-bomb tests unleash such a torrent of protest that U.S. officials are forced to consider nuclear arms controls, including a nuclear test ban. As U.S. Secretary of State John Foster Dulles conceded in a, a, a secret meeting of the National Security Council, there had developed, quote, a popular and diplomatic pressure for limitation of armament that cannot be resisted by the United States without our forfeiting the goodwill of our allies and the support of a large part of our own people. By the late 1950s, U.S. action had become a political necessity. In 1957, after government weapons scientists made a sales pitch for continued nuclear testing, President Eisenhower retorted that, quote, we are up against an extremely difficult world opinion situation, and the U.S. government could not uh, permit itself to be crucified on a cross of atoms. When in March 1958 the Soviet government began a unilateral halt to nuclear testing, the U.S. government was on the spot. Nuclear testing, uh, President Eisenhower declared, uh, was not evil, quote, not evil, but people have been brought to believe that it is. Dulles agreed, stating, quote, the uh, uh, opinion of peoples throughout the world is sharply opposed to the continuance of nuclear testing. And accordingly, the United States would have to announce its, its readiness to stop such nuclear testing. The result was a voluntary moratorium on, on nuclear tests by the U.S., British, and Soviet governments beginning that year, 1958. Despite a, a deadlock on, on negotiations for a test ban treaty, none of these governments dared to resume nuclear testing for the next three years. Even when the Russians started up atmospheric tests once more, in the fall of 1961, U.S. government um, uh, leaders remain hesitant. President Kennedy agreed with his Secretary of State, Dean Rusk, who argued that there would be a, quote, serious political reaction were we to resume testing. Consequently, the ad administration refrained from atmospheric nuclear tests for nearly eight months. Although in April 1962, the, the Kennedy administration finally did resume atmospheric nuclear tests, it now went to unprecedented lengths to secure a test ban treaty. That November 1962, Kennedy met with Norman Cousins, the founder and co-chair of SANE, the National Committee for SANE Nuclear Policy, and urged Cousins um, to convince Soviet Premier Nikita Khrushchev of his, Kennedy's, uh, sincerity in, in seeking a test ban. Cousins began shuttling between the two world leaders and in the spring of 1963 convinced Kennedy to deliver a speech that would signal a break with past U.S. hostility toward the Soviet Union. Uh, delivered that June, this American University address, and there's Kennedy uh, delivering it in, in Washington, partially written by Norman Cousins, emphasized the administration's desire to ban nuclear testing and announced new test ban negotiations. U.S., British, and Soviet officials signed an atmospheric test ban treaty that summer, 1963. Some policymakers have, have conceded that this first nuclear arms control treaty was a direct response to popular protest. 
According to Glenn Seaborg, the chair of the Atomic Energy Commission during the 1960s, the Atmospheric Test Ban Treaty resulted from, quote, persistent pressure on the nuclear powers by influential leaders and movements throughout the world. McGeorge Bundy, Kennedy's national security advisor, wrote that he agreed with Seaborg that the test ban, quote, was achieved primarily by world opinion. Some officials are even more specific. Jerome Wiesner, Kennedy's White House science advisor, gave the major credit for pushing President Kennedy toward the partial test ban treaty to sane, women strike for peace, and Linus Pauling. The move's effectiveness is underscored by its impact on the Reagan administration. Here's one of uh, Reagan's campaign buttons that I obtained at the Reagan Library in Simi Valley, California. Ronald Reagan had opposed every nuclear arms control measure negotiated by Democratic or Republican administrations. Uh, and his top national security officials were drawn from the ultra-hawkish Committee on the Present Danger. Nuclear arms controls, they believed, were extremely dangerous. The policy of these Reaganites was to sponsor vast U.S. nuclear buildup. Not surprisingly, they panicked at the rise of, of the nuclear freeze campaign, launching a major public relations effort to counter it. The Reagan administration's damage control efforts were paralleled by important shifts in U.S. policy. Under pressure from beleaguered West European government leaders, the, the administration announced the most radical disarmament proposal yet, the zero option, as it was called, foregoing any installation of U.S. intermediate-range nuclear missiles in Europe if the, the, the Russians would remove all of theirs. This offer was designed to dampen anti-nuclear protest by coming through with a, a, a disarmament offer. Um, key U.S. And, and other NATO officials, such as Margaret Thatcher, went along with it in the expectation that the Russians would reject it, for it, it traded a, a U.S. deployment plan, um, that is something that hadn't taken place yet, just a plan, for uh, Soviet SS-20 missiles already in place. But it did uh, commit the U.S. government to a sweeping program of nuclear disarmament if the Soviet government was willing to take the plunge. During the ensuing months, when the Russians displayed a, a lack of interest in the Reagan Euro missile uh, proposals, the Reagan administration continued to back away from its hard line. First, it toyed with the walk in, in the woods formula for the missiles by U.S. disarmament negotiator Paul Nitze. Then in the face of fierce West European resistance, it also scrapped its announced plans to deploy the neutron bomb. Uh, President Carter had, had actually backed off his plans for that, but uh, Reagan had promised to uh, deploy it, and now he backed off. Anti-nuclear efforts also affected U.S. strategic arms policy. By building the MX missile, the administration planned a dramatic expansion and modernization of the land-based U.S. Uh, intercontinental ballistic missile system. But Congress, and particularly congressional Democrats, who had begun to court disarmament groups, refused to support the, the Reaganites' plan. Ultimately, after years of e exhausting effort, the administration managed to secure funding for only 50 of the 200 MX missiles originally proposed. Recalling the administration's frustration at its failure to uh, substantially upgrade its ICBM force, Secretary of State George Shultz lamented, quote, given the political climate in the United States, we could not keep pace in modernization, production, and deployment of these deadly weapons. This, in turn, meant that reducing Soviet ICBMs through a disarmament agreement uh, became ever more important to U.S. officials. Furthermore, the administration found that the price of Senate support for funding even token numbers of MX missiles was the display of a strong commitment to nuclear disarmament. As Reagan's national security advisor, Robert McFarlane, told me uh, during an interview, quote, you had to have appropriations, and to get them you needed political support, and that meant that you had to have an arms control policy worthy of the name. Moreover, in spite of the fact that the Reaganites had publicly denounced the SOL II Treaty, uh, negotiated by President Carter, 
for supposedly opening the way to Soviet military conquest of, of the United States. Um, the Reaganites now uh, clung to it to appease their anti-nuclear critics. Thus, year after year, they accepted the limits of this unratified treaty, one that they believed that the Soviet Union violated. To be sure, with the Russians quite unyielding as to an intermediate nuclear forces, INF treaty, the administration did begin deploying the Cruise and Pershing II missiles in Western Europe in late 1983. But in the context of the massive public protests of these five million people in, in the streets, Reagan grew uh, seriously uh, rattled. In October 1983, he told his startled Secretary of State, quote, if things get hotter and hotter and arms control remains an issue, maybe I should go see Soviet Premier Yuri Andropov and, and propose eliminating all nuclear weapons. Secretary of State George Shultz was horrified by, by, by the statement. Uh, he couldn't believe Reagan was, was saying this. But Shultz agreed that, quote, we were feeling uh, political pressure against our, our continuing INF deployment. We, we could not leave matters as they stood. Reagan recalled in his memoirs, quote, we were on the defensive. Consequently, on January 16, 1984, Reagan delivered a, a, a remarkable uh, public address calling for peace with the Soviet Union and for a nuclear-free world. His advisors agree that the speech was designed to signal to the Russians his willingness to end the Cold War and reduce nuclear arsenals, and it appears to have been sincere. Thereafter, he pressed very hard for the resumption of nuclear disarmament uh, uh, negotiations with, with the Russians, which they resisted. All this happened during Reagan's first term in office, before the reign, I'm, I'm sorry, during the reign uh, of Brezhnev, Andropov, and Chernyenko in the Soviet Union, before the advent of Mikhail Gorbachev. Once Gorbachev came to power in March 1985, the way lay open for significant arms control and disarmament agreements. Gorbachev was not only a true believer in nuclear disarmament, but a movement convert. The Soviet leader's new thinking, uh, by which he meant the necessity for peace and disarmament in the nuclear age, came from a well-known anti-nuclear statement by Einstein in 1946, uh, repeated in the Russell-Einstein Appeal of 1955. Gorbachev's advisors have frequently pointed to the powerful influence on Gorbachev of the Western nuclear disarmament movement. Gorbachev himself declared, quote, the new thinking took into account and absorbed the conclusions and demands of the movements of physicians, scientists, and of various anti-war organizations. Gorbachev met frequently with leaders of the nuclear disarmament movement and often took their advice. For example, he initiated and, and later continued a unilateral Soviet nuclear testing moratorium on the advice of, of Bernard Laun, founder and co-chair of International Physicians for the Prevention of Nuclear War. And, and here on your, on, on your left in the foreground is Gorbachev, and on your right is, is Laun, and they're talking in the uh, Kremlin uh, about just how to do this. Um, let me uh, tell you uh, a little story um, uh, that I recall that, that Lown told me when I interviewed him uh, about this. <clears throat> um, he, was, he, he was told that he only had a, a short time uh, to meet with the, the uh, Soviet leader. He had maybe uh, 15 minutes. Uh, and therefore, uh, he should get his arguments uh, ready to go and, and fully stated in those 15 minutes. So he did, and uh, uh, he met with uh, Gorbachev at, at this meeting. Uh, and he, he, he stated what he, he wanted to say, and then Gorbachev spoke, and then Laun spoke, and Gorbachev spoke, and Laun spoke, and, 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 and the meeting went on for about 30 minutes, 40 minutes, and he glanced at his watch, but Gorbachev was, was still going, and so if Gorbachev was going to go, Laun was going to keep talking, and so he did, uh, and, and then uh, the meeting moved on to an hour or more, and Gorbachev was, was still there talking to him. Uh, about how to deal with the arms race. Um, so finally, Gorbachev noticed Laun checking his watch, uh, you know, Laun being uh, amazed that he could keep going here. 
Uh, and he, he, uh, Gorbachev turned to Laun and he said, uh, what's the matter, Laun? You have something better to do with your time? <laughs> so again, uh, here was this, this Soviet leader who was absolutely willing to, and, and indeed devoted to meeting with anti-nuclear activists. Furthermore, Gorbachev decided against the building of a Star Wars anti-missile system on the advice of key anti-nuclear scientists. He also split the Star Wars issue from the INF issue, thus taking the a, a crucial step toward the INF Treaty, the Intermediate Nuclear Forces Treaty. This too was based in large part on the arguments made to him by U.S. and Soviet anti-nuclear scientists. His decision also reflected public sentiment. At a key meeting of, uh, of the uh, Politburo, uh, the uh, Soviet ruling body, in February 1987, uh, Gorbachev secretly told Soviet party leaders that uh, delinking Star Wars from the Intermediate Nuclear Forces Treaty would, quote, be our response to the state of public opinion in the world. When Gorbachev suddenly called the U.S. government's bluff by agreeing to remove all the Euro missiles from Europe, that uh, zero option that I had mentioned, it horrified NATO's hawks. But, as Schultz declared, quote, if the United States reversed its stand now, such a reversal would be political dynamite. Or, as Kenneth Edelman, Reagan's hawkish director of the Arms Control and Disarmament Agency, put it, quote, we had to take yes for an answer. Thus, in late 1987, Reagan and, and Gorbachev signed the INF Treaty, which removed all intermediate-range nuclear missiles from Europe. And here they are at the signing ceremonies. Though the movement began to decline after that, it retained some in influence on uh, public officials. President George H.W. Bush, uh, that's the, the senior Bush, um, um, and, and his Secretary of State, James Baker, felt that uh, Reagan had moved too fast and too far toward nuclear disarmament and abruptly halted disarmament negotiations. In fact, the U.S. and uh, British governments wanted to uh, significantly upgrade and expand short-range nuclear forces in Western Europe. Uh, that is, having, having gotten rid of intermediate-range missiles there, they now said, well, we have to have some missiles there, so let's put in more uh, and better um, um, uh, short-range U.S. nuclear missiles. But a number of West European governments frightened at the prospect of a revival of public protest, resisted this move. When uh, Gorbachev heightened popu uh, popular demands for nuclear disarmament by removing short-range missiles from Eastern Europe, Baker was horrified. The Secretary of State wrote in, in his memoirs, quote, we were losing the battle for public opinion. We had to do something. NATO could not afford an another crisis over deploying nuclear weapons. Thus, uh, the Bush ad administration retreated and uh, agreed to negotiate missile reductions. Eventually, in a sharp departure from past practice, it withdrew all U.S. short-range uh, nuclear missiles from Western Europe unilaterally. The impact of the anti-nuclear -nu movement upon nuclear testing was even more direct. Since the mid-1980s, uh, disarmament groups around the world have been working to end underground nuclear weapons e explosions. That partial test ban treaty of 1963 ended explosions in the, in the air, in the atmosphere, but not underground. And so the great powers simply moved testing underground. Um, large demonstrations were organized at the U.S. nuclear test site in Nevada. Inspired by these actions, a massive Nevada semi-Palatinsk nuclear disarmament movement emerged in the Soviet Union. And here's one of its demonstrations there. Where it eventually forced the closure of the Soviet nuclear testing sites. Meanwhile, sympathetic members of the U.S. Congress introduced a variety of bills to halt U.S. nuclear testing. In 1991, a, a, a freshman member of the House of Representatives, who was indebted to peace groups for their political support, and who had participated in the Nevada demonstrations, agreed to sponsor a, a new congressional attempt to terminate funding for U.S. nuclear tests. The final legislation, passed in the summer of 1992, halted underground nuclear testing for nine months, placed strict conditions on any further U.S. nuclear testing, 
and require test ban negotiations and an end to all U.S. testing by late 1996. Having halted U.S. and Soviet nuclear testing, the movement pushed on in the following years to uh, secure a comprehensive test ban treaty. During Bill Clinton's first year as president, he began to renege on his earlier uh, commitment to support such a treaty. Consequently, disarmament groups and members of Congress conducted a test ban campaign, which later that year led the administration to extend the U.S. nuclear testing moratorium, press other nations to join it, and, and begin efforts to uh, secure a comprehensive test ban treaty. Finally, in September 1996, representatives of countries from around the world celebrated the signing of the Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty. Speaking at the United Nations ceremonies, U.S. Ambassador Madeleine Albright declared, quote, this was a treaty sought by ordinary people everywhere, and today the power of that universal wish could not be denied. Government leaders also felt constrained by popular pressure from using the bomb. In 1956, Henry Cabot Lodge, Jr., at that time U.S. Ambassador to the United Nations, complained that the atomic bomb had acquired, quote, a bad name, and to such an extent that it seriously inhibits us from using it. He stated this secretly, of, of, of course, in a, uh, a National Security Council meeting. Uh, in, indeed, later that year, when the Joint Chiefs of Staff and other administration officials called for greater flexibility in the employment of nuclear weapons, Eisenhower uh, responded, quote, the use of nuclear weapons would raise serious political problems in, in view of the current state of world opinion. In mid-1957, countering ambitious proposals for nuclear war fighting, Secretary of State Dulles told a National Security Council meeting that, quote, world opinion is not yet ready to accept the general use of nuclear weapons. Brushing off pleas from the Secretary of, of Defense to use them, Dulles remain adamant that the United States must not, quote, get out of step with world opinion. Similarly, when it came to the Vietnam conflict, the Kennedy administration found nuclear war politically impossible. And here's Kennedy uh, with his Secretary of Defense, Robert McNamara. Indeed, uh, recalled Dean Rusk, the Kennedy, Johnson, and Nixon ad administrations deliberately, quote, lost the war rather than win it with nuclear weapons. Although Nixon entered the White House as a nuclear en enthusiast, he, he recognized the limits set by popular loathing of the bomb. Had he used nuclear weapons in the war, Nixon recalled bitterly, quote, the resulting domestic and international uproar would have damaged our foreign policy on all fronts. Bundy, who served as a national security advisor to two of these presidents, maintained that, that the U.S. government's decision not to use nuclear weapons in the Vietnam War did not result from fear of, of nuclear re retaliation by the Russians and Chinese, but from the terrible public reaction that a, a U.S. nuclear attack would uh, uh, provoke in other nations. Even more significant, Bundy maintained, was the prospect of public upheaval in the United States. For, quote, no president could hope for understanding and support from his own countrymen if he used the bomb. This nuclear uh, taboo seemed to dissipate with the advent of the Reagan administration, whose top national security officials, from the president on down, entered office talking of fighting and winning a nuclear war. But this position quickly changed as the Reagan administration came to recognize that its glib talk of nuclear war was a political disaster that played into the hands of its critics. Starting in April 1982, Reagan began declaring publicly that, quote, a nuclear war cannot be won and must never be fought. He added, quote, to those who protest against nuclear war, I can only say, I'm with you. Now, of course, it's possible to dismiss this, this shift uh, in Reagan rhetoric as no more than a, a, a public relations gesture. Even so, such rhetoric uh, creates a public commitment, one making it considerably more difficult to reverse direction and to start waging nuclear war. Nor is, is there any evidence that the, uh, the, the Reagan administration gave nuclear war serious consideration. And so, I bring uh, to you some uh, good news. 
Popular protest has blunted the nuclear ambitions of hawkish government officials and uh, prevented the waging of nuclear war. But there's also some bad news. Government accommodation to nuclear pressure has gone only so far. Despite important policy changes that have reduced nuclear arsenals by, by uh, roughly two-thirds and uh, prevented nuclear war, over 23,000 nuclear weapons still remain in existence. Furthermore, given the sharp decline of the nuclear disarmament movement since the late 1980s, government officials have felt freer to spurn nuclear arms control measures and to sponsor nuclear buildups. Uh, the Republican-dominated U.S. Senate rejected the Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty. India, Pakistan, and North Korea joined the nuclear club. And U.S. President George W. Bush, uh, strengthened by the American public's sense of in insecurity after the events of 9-11, totally abandoned uh, uh, the U.S. government's commitment to nuclear arms control and disarmament. The Bush administration pulled the United States out of the anti-ballistic missile treaty, uh, opposed any effort to ratify the comprehensive test ban treaty, and pressed Congress for funds to develop new, more usable nuclear weapons. Nonetheless, there are recent signs that the world is getting back on the disarmament track. Peace and disarmament organizations have undergone a substantial revival. Congress rejected the Bush administration's proposals for new nuclear weapons. Formerly top national security officials in the United States and uh, overseas have spoken out in favor of nuclear abolition. And President Obama has not only called for ratification of the Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty and, of course, of this new uh, treaty w with uh, uh, Russia to make uh, significant cuts in uh, strategic nuclear arsenals, um, but for building a nuclear-free world. These are popular positions. Poll after poll shows overwhelming anti-nuclear sentiment among the general public. An opinion survey during the summer of 2007 found that the abolition of all nuclear weapons through an enforceable agreement was supported by 74% of the public in the United States, 85% in, in Britain, 87% in France, and 95% in Germany and Italy. In a more recent poll, 84% of Americans said they would feel safer in a world where no nation, including the United States, had nuclear weapons. What then should we conclude? Governments can be convinced to adopt policies of nuclear restraint, at least when there is sufficient public pressure. When that pressure has been mobilized by uh, peace activists, um, governments have responded, curbing the nuclear arms race, and rejecting nuclear war. If the full strength of public pressure can be brought to bear over the next few years, if the public can be roused from its, its, its torpor and mobilized, we will have a remarkable opportunity before us, the opportunity to establish a nuclear-free world and, and to end the threat of nuclear annihilation forever. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> All right, uh, first Reagan. Um, Reagan entered office as, as an arch hawk, and, and I'm sure you, you recall his campaign, and indeed that uh, campaign button gave you some, some sense of his, his uh, policy. Uh, and that's what his whole entourage thought. And when I, and, but the, the, the fact is that, that Reagan did, an, did a, a 180-degree uh, turnabout. That is, he, he ended up as the uh, first president uh, in U.S. history to actually uh, preside over a disarmament agreement that is actually getting rid of nuclear weapons rather than just arms control, rather than just regulating them through the Partial Test Ban Treaty. Uh, and the reason for that, I, I'm uh, suggesting to you, is, is that there was so much public pressure on him that as a good politician and as a good actor, uh, he responded to his audience. And uh, um, uh, Reagan knew uh, which way the wind was blowing at, the, at that point. And uh, for, a, for a brief time, he, he uh, fought against it. And then he simply gave way, and he, he got out in front of the uh, parade and he became a nuclear uh, disarmer. And this shocked 
his uh, supporters, not just uh, in, in, in the public, but also in the administration that had always regarded him as a, a, a sincere foe of arms control and disarmament. When I interviewed many of them, they told me uh, they never would have uh, believed Reagan would have gone along with and indeed sponsored an arms control or disarmament treaty, because that's not what they wanted at, at, at all. Um, so um, we have to uh, account for that change. Now, um, his uh, hawkish uh, supporters now say that, well, Ronald Reagan was always against nuclear weapons, <laughs> and, and therefore that wasn't any, any, any great surprise. But in fact, if, if he was always against nuclear weapons, then why did he uh, oppose every arms control and disarmament treaty of, uh, of the past? Why did he campaign on, on, on the basis uh, not of arms control and disarmament, but uh, building up uh, the U.S. nuclear arsenal and indeed fighting nuclear wars? So I think we uh, see a, a real change here, and it's based on, on, on popular pressure and uh, public opinion, which was hostile to that uh, mad bomber image that he came in with. Um, your second question, I've, I've, I've forgotten in the flow of my rhetoric here. The, the, the turnaround there. Oh, right, well, public sentiment. Once you did sign it, then the All public right. attention kind of... All right. Um, the peace movement, um, like uh, other social movements, um, can um, uh, decline thanks to uh, gains, that is, uh, uh, let's take the labor movement as an e example. Uh, great upsurge of, uh, of labor movement organizing and protest during the 1930s, leading to the uh, creation of the CIO uh, and a militant labor movement, as well as to uh, major uh, reforms, um, um, uh, major new uh, labor laws, not just the Wagner Act, but, but um, uh, minimum wage laws and maximum hour laws and a whole range of other things that the labor movement had been championing uh, for many years. Uh, and the labor movement was very happy about those, justifiably. But nonetheless, that, that took the edge off uh, a workers' desire for strikes and for militant action and for uh, mobilization and so on. And, and, and so, after these great reforms, uh, the labor movement began to grow complacent. And not surprisingly, in, in, in the end, uh, corporations uh, uh, made an onslaught on this weakened, uh, complacent labor movement, and they began to uh, succeed uh, and to break strikes and a whole range of other things like that. Um, and similarly, with the anti-nuclear movement, that is having um, managed to actually win in that, that uh, struggle to get a, a, a partial test ban treaty in, 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 into place that struggle to end atmospheric nuclear testing, uh, many people said, after years of, of protest, well, it's, it's, it's time now to cultivate our own gardens. The, the great powers are showing some common sense now, and uh, things are under control. So we can turn to uh, some other uh, issues, such as the Vietnam War, or uh, such as uh, environmentalism, or such as women's liberation, and so on. Uh, and that's understandable that they would move toward dealing with those other issues. But nonetheless, uh, the, the fact is that any movement tends to be vulnerable to uh, complacency after it, it, it wins some, some, some victories. And that's, that's true after the INF Treaty uh, of um, uh, 1987, too, uh, when Reagan and Gorbachev signed it. Uh, your last point about um, drones and so on, uh, so far they, they aren't carrying nuclear weapons. Uh, I, I, I certainly hope they don't. And again, it's up to the public, it's up to you to see to it that they don't because uh, political leaders are sensitive uh, to your opinions. They are sensitive to, to uh, mobilizations. They are sensitive to uh, letters in, in, in the press and letters to members of Congress and so on. And they back off. Uh, yes. Uh, right, right. Uh, refresh my, my memory as to your first question again. I, I sort of lost it while thinking about it. Yes. Yeah. All right. All right. Yes, yes. All right. Okay. So the, um, um, the fact is that we're dealing with a, a, a phenomenon that goes deeper than any uh, particular weapon, and it, it's the phenomenon of uh, conflict among nation states on, on, on the world scene, and, and, and uh, before nation states, uh, competing territories um, that have always 
um, uh, utilize force in their uh, disputes, uh, in, in their conflicts with one another. Um, uh, cave A, or the people in Cave A, uh, were worried about the, the people in Cave B who might get, get, get uh, uh, um, uh, more rabbits uh, caught or uh, uh, killed a deer uh, and so on, and they would therefore have, have less food. And, and so they would arm themselves with uh, clubs uh, and later spears and uh, bows and arrows and, and so on and so on. And they kept ad ad advancing, if, if, if we can call it that, on uh, in later centuries to, uh, um, to um, swords and guns and uh, machine guns and uh, battleships and uh, bombers uh, and nuclear missiles and so on. So the atomic bomb and the hydrogen bomb, a uh, later variant on the the atomic bomb, uh, are simply the latest weapons uh, utilized in this ages-old confrontation, uh, um, uh, this war uh, among all. Uh, and um, therefore, leaders of those responsible for the national security of territories or nations tend to think uh, of national security through military strength. And if you have a great new weapon, then you uh, you uh, develop that, and you stockpile it, and you use it uh, against your foes. And, and, and so, uh, not surprisingly, um, that old thinking, as we could, uh, I think, call it, uh, that thinking that has gone on for thousands and thousands of years uh, among uh, uh, competing jurisdictions, uh, continues today uh, among the uh, policy makers uh, of, of uh, nation states, uh, particularly those of the great powers uh, who are more inclined than most uh, to wage war. Uh, the public, though, uh, regards nuclear weapons somewhat differently, or at least a large portion of, of the public. Uh, they regard nuclear weapons as the victims of those weapons, as, as the people who are going to be wiped out en, en masse uh, in the case of world destruction. And therefore, uh, those are two di very different viewpoints. Um, the old thinking versus the new thinking, as Gorbachev referred to it. Uh, and even some policymakers have begun to get the message that there's new thinking needed if the world is going to uh, survive. Uh, and your second point again was? About uh, how they just disregarded that you know, when Bush came in. Uh, oh, all right. Well, um, for one thing, uh, the Bush administration really, in, in the context of 9-11 and all those flags waving, you recall that, and so on, um, uh, in, in, the, in the context of that surge of, of, of nationalism and, and rallying around the flag, um, Bush had public sentiment on, on his side. He really did. Uh, a, a, a fanaticized public, not the whole public, uh, to be sure, not the peace movement, but a good section of the public, and, and certainly uh, the mass media, were all for war at that point. And they really didn't seem to care against whom. That is, the, the uh, Iraqi government hadn't, hadn't caused the 9-11 uh, uh, attacks, but th they were somebody to uh, attack and, and show uh, America was fighting back, right, uh, in Bush's rhetoric. Uh, so uh, he got away with that for a time, uh, till the public began to see that uh, Iraq had nothing to do with it, and this war was a disaster. Uh, and begin to uh, question why the United States was, was fighting that, that war. Uh, and therefore, um, uh, once the public shifted, uh, Congress began to line up against the war, and a uh, debate began on how to cut off funding for the war, and the Democrats began to campaign against the war, and, and so on and so on. Uh, so I think that public sentiment was more significant than you're implying here. Yes. Well, I'm not sure that, all right, there's certainly heinous weapons, and there are others too. There are uh, cluster bombs and, uh, and, and, and landmines and so on, and in, in my view, they should all be banned. But um, let me remind you that a single nuclear weapon can uh, destroy 100,000 people. And remember that uh, 23,000 of them, if, if, if used, can do incredible damage. Uh, far more than the uh, uh, radioactivity or even the nuclear fallout from nuclear testing. So I think we should focus uh, uh, primarily, but not solely, on nuclear weapons, uh, since they're the real uh, world destroyers, it seems to me. I don't think so. Uh, now, the, the uh, administration uh, under, uh, under uh, George W. Bush 
tried to get uh, a nuclear bunker buster um, um, funded by Congress, but failed. Congress turned it down. Um, so they're, they're forced to go with uh, conventional weapons in, in terms of, of building them. And they're not as powerful. Uh, they'd like to have nuclear bunker busters. So I, so I think they could, they could be more devastating. Uh, yes? I went to a lecture. Sure. Uh, I'm no scientist, so I, I can't really uh, talk science very well. But um, as uh, Helen Caldicott has maintained uh, in, in the past, um, each, uh, each nuclear reactor is a bomb factory. <coughs> It, it, it can turn out uh, plutonium and highly uh, enriched uranium and so on. So, and, and, and that's the uh, fissile material, the explosive material uh, for nuclear weapons. Uh, and that's why the U.S. government is at, at uh, loggerheads today with, with the Iranian government. The Iranians say, well, uh, we're not uh, building nuclear weapons. We're, we're, we're simply uh, developing peaceful nuclear power. Uh, the U.S. government says, but you could use that for nuclear weapons and so on, uh, particularly as you enrich it, uh, and therefore, uh, uh, yeah. Well, th that's a, a different point. I'd rather uh, the U.S. government got rid of its nuclear weapons and so on uh, to uh, show the Iranians that that no nations should have them and so on, rather than all nations should have them. Yeah. Right to do that because they are a signatory to the non-proliferation treaty. Right. Right. Yes, yes, they do. And, and it, well, let me say something about the Nuclear uh, Non-Proliferation Treaty, uh, since in many ways it's the centerpiece, not only for the uh, upcoming uh, UN conference this coming May, but also uh, in terms of the great bargain that was struck between nuclear nations and non-nuclear nations. Uh, most people in the United States, uh, uh, particularly, um, view the Non-Proliferation Treaty as a, a treaty in, in which non-nuclear nations have agreed not to develop nuclear weapons. But it's much more than that. That was the kind of uh, treaty uh, proposed at the United Nations by the United States and the Soviet Union, who thought it would be a fine idea if uh, all other nations were banned from having nuclear weapons, uh, agreed not to have them, and they continued to have theirs. Uh, now, the non-nuclear nations very quickly said, well, that's uh, a double standard. You'll have yours and we won't have ours. Um, you know, we're not going to do that. We're not going to sign onto that treaty. So the treaty was changed. Um, and, and the one that was finally signed, the one in force since 1970, uh, provides that the non-nuclear powers uh, forego developing nuclear weapons. And the nuclear powers agree to get rid of their nuclear weapons so that rather than having equality among nations by, by uh, upgrading, uh, spiraling up with the nuclear arms race, it will spiral downward till there are no nuclear weapons on, on the world scene. Now, over time, nations ha have grown impatient um, uh, with the failure of the other side in this debate, non-nuclear versus nuclear. Uh, and uh, some non-nuclear nations, like India, for example, which had uh, campaigned against nuclear weapons for decades, um, finally said, well, um, since you nuclear powers don't seem to ever get around to getting rid of your nuclear weapons, then we're going to build ours. And if, if you get around to getting rid of them, we'll get rid of ours too, but not till then. Uh, and, um, um, they must have also noticed yeah. that we don't attack nuclear nations. Yeah. Well, but uh, we ha haven't attacked um, many non-nuclear nations we've had, had wars against, as in Vietnam and so on. Or the Soviets didn't attack uh, Afghanistan, although they lost that, uh, that war too, with, with nuclear weapons. Yeah. So again, um, I would suggest to you that, that having nuclear weapons or not having them isn't the whole game here. Um, but uh, again, the... Um, the non-nuclear powers began to resent the nuclear powers holding on to their arsenals and say, saying, we're justified in developing them. And the Iranian government today says, you have nuclear weapons and so on. Why are you uh, condemning us for only developing peaceful nuclear power? Um, so what's going to happen at the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty uh, Review Conference is that, I, I, I suspect, that... Um, uh, the nuclear nations are going to point the finger at Iran and other nations that might be on the, on the road to uh, joining the nuclear club. 
and they're going to say, oh, you shouldn't do, do that as a signatory to the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty. And the non-nuclear powers will say to nuclear powers, well, you still have tens of thousands of nuclear weapons. Who are you to tell us that we're violating that, that uh, treaty? You're violating it. And in fact, 96% um, of those 23,000 nuclear weapons are held by the United States and Russia today. And even with the START Treaty, they're only getting rid of uh, roughly uh, uh, 1,400 nuclear <laughs> weapons out of their more than uh, 20,000 nuclear weapons that, that they have. So um, that double standard continues. Well, I think that's why they, they uh, develop bombers and, and why they develop missiles and uh, uh, why they develop atomic bombs and, and H-bombs. Uh, uh, but I think that uh, uh, that's simply an extension of the old drive for uh, power uh, through military might. Uh, and I don't think it's really new that, that is, as a historian, I, I see this as same-o, same-o, you know, that, that they're, they're just playing that, that same game, that, that old thinking once more. Uh, and, and in fact, um, I guess we can, we can say there's one new element in that game, and that leads to new thinking, and that is that at a certain point, warfare, this uh, this practice, that, this bad habit that, that goes back uh, thousands of years, um, becomes so destructive that it becomes counterproductive, right? Uh, that you might want to wage war when you can conquer other lands and, and, and occupy them and use their resources and so on. But what happens when you uh, turn them into uh, uh, radioactive rubble? Can you occupy them? Uh, what happens when there's no one living anymore? What happens when you uh, uh, win, quote unquote, uh, a nuclear war, but uh, 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 end up uh, uh, losing half your uh, population uh, and uh, uh, bring on nuclear winter that will uh, turn the, the, the skies dark and uh, blot out, out the sun and cause massive famine, not just in, in, in some foreign country, but in your own. Um, what does victory mean in those circumstances? And therefore, I think in, in certain ways, um, the, the reason for the rise of the peace movement in, in the United States and in other nations too is that warfare ha has become ever more counterproductive. Uh, 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 if, if one traces the history of the peace movement in, in world history, it, it only begins to develop in, in the early 19th century when science and technology uh, advance the art of killing to such an extent that many people start to conclude um, that it doesn't work very well that it loses more than it gains for us. And by the time of nuclear weapons, that, that's pretty clear. Yes. Uh, well, uh, we've come uh, fairly close to it a number of times. Uh, for example, in, in that same fall of 1983, when there were five million people in the streets and the, the uh, US government was in, installing those Cruise and uh, Pershing II missiles, um, the um, uh, Soviet government uh, was petrified, the, the uh, KGB was horrified at, at the prospect that the Reagan administration, who they viewed as a mad bomber, um, was about to uh, uh, launch nuclear war against the uh, Soviet Union. Uh, and uh, specifically during a NATO training exercise called Abel Archer um, in that, that same fall. Uh, and uh, the, the Soviet view was that, that while NATO went through the training exercise at, at preparing for war and so on, but not really waging it, uh, the U.S. government was really mobilizing for war. They were, they were using that as a, a cloak behind which they could ready their, their missiles and, and, and their forces to uh, attack the uh, Soviet Union. And therefore, the Soviet Union placed their forces, their nuclear forces, on alert at that point um, because no nation uh, wants to see its military forces wiped out by the other side before they can launch them. So they were getting ready to launch their missiles at that point. Uh, they didn't, as it turned out. Uh, uh, cooler heads uh, prevailed, but uh, the world came uh, pretty close to nuclear war thanks to a mistake, thanks to paranoia on, on the part of uh, Soviet leaders. Uh, and other incidents somewhat like that happened um, when the, um, the uh, commander of Soviet nuclear forces uh, or, or the military official who, who was in charge of them in any case, um, uh, noticed that the radar in the Soviet Union, or the, not, not, not radar, the, uh, 
um, what do you call that, uh, space warnings kinds of things that they had and, and so on, uh, early warning system, um, um, indicated that the U.S. government had fired its missiles at the Soviet Union, that there were things in the sky that were coming toward the Soviet Union, and that looked like uh, a U.S. nuclear attack. And he had to decide whether to launch the Soviet missiles. And he decided not to do it. He, 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 he uh, concluded that the early warning stuff ha ha had malfunctioned. And so he, he decided not to do it. But he, it, he, he was so filled with anxiety at this choice of dooming the world or perhaps dooming just the Soviet Union that he had a mental breakdown at that point. He had to be hospitalized a a after that. Uh, and and that, th those are just two of many incidents that can be pointed to, although the uh, Cuban Missile Crisis, for example, is often pointed to as, as well as an example w w uh, of the world sliding toward nuclear war when the leaders of neither nation wanted it. But there are also times when, uh, when nuclear weapons have been lost, when U.S. planes carrying them have crashed, although they have, the, the bombs haven't exploded, but the planes crashed. Uh, there are still uh, nuclear weapons, I think, off South Carolina, where, where U.S. planes crashed into the a Atlantic, where they, they've never found them, and so on. Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, there have been hundreds of uh, terrorist threats of, uh, uh, of nuclear uh, strikes and of nuclear e explosions in major cities. Um, so there, there's a really live possibility that nuclear war might take place even when people don't want it to take place, when there's no rational plan for it. Um, not to mention some terrorists getting hold of nuclear weapons and so on. So that uh, I think we're lucky that we haven't had nuclear war since 1945. And as long as nuclear weapons exist, those dangers will persist. For example, uh, terrorist use of, of nuclear weapons. Um, terrorists can't build nuclear weapons on, on, on their own. They, they, they don't have the uh, technological knowledge or the territory to uh, uh, build them. Uh, or the ability to test them so someplace and, and so on. Um, but they can get them, at least in, in theory, thanks to uh, bribery or black market operations or to theft um, and, and so on, a whole uh, series of, of ways that uh, terrorists have tried to get them in the past but have been caught doing it. Um, so that uh, as, as long as those weapons exist in, in, in national arsenals, there's a threat of nuclear terrorism. If you get rid of the nuclear weapons, if there are zero nuclear weapons, then terrorists can't uh, conduct nuclear terror. All right, uh, I, I never heard of these things uh, and so on, uh, of uh, uh, constitution-free zones and, and, and so on. Uh, there are nuclear-free zones in, in the world wherein uh, countries got together and agreed that uh, uh, nuclear weapons would not be uh, deployed there. And in fact, uh, a good portion of the uh, southern hemisphere is now uh, a nuclear-free zone. And that, too, was a, uh, a great victory for the, uh, the anti-nuclear campaign, uh, particularly in, in the countries that are part of those zones. Uh, other questions? Yes. Right. Well, I think that's one of the great dangers uh, in, in nations having nuclear arsenals. That is, you, you never know what kind of a political leadership you're going to have. And therefore, if they have that you know, those nuclear weapons on their hip, they might use them. If they don't have them, they, they can't use them. And therefore, I think the world is, is much safer uh, without them. And we shouldn't assume that they'll never be used if, if they exist. Yes. Yes, that's true. And, and that was, again, one of, of, the, of the great gains. Uh, U.S. nuclear weapons uh, uh, were uh, provided to the uh, Canadian Armed Forces during the early 1960s, but the uh, Canadian government phased them out. Yeah, al although the, the uh, Canadians did uh, produce uranium for uh, U.S. nuclear weapons, uh, and they, uh, uh, they also worked on a certain missile uh, technology. But uh, you're right, the, the uh, Canadian movement was such that even after Canada uh, began to accept U.S. nuclear weapons as, as, as part of, of, of NATO, uh, under great pressure by the United States and the uh, Kennedy administration, uh, um, later, uh, Canadian governments under uh, Trudeau uh, got rid of the weapons. Um, le le let me just mention this uh, question of uh, alerting or, or de-alerting uh, nuclear weapons. Um, thousands of nuclear weapons are ready to be fired uh, today. I mean, they're, they're not just put in boxes somewhere. Um, they can be fired uh, almost instantaneously. 
Um, there are thousands pointed at, at the United States uh, from Russia, and there are thousands uh, pointed at, at Russia from the, the United States. And so I think uh, deal alerting such, such weapons would be um, one way of uh, 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 moving us back from the, uh, the uh, precipice. Yes. Oh, uh, well, <clears throat> that, that one big uh, protest uh, um, uh, before the, uh, 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 the Iraq war that went on worldwide was actually bigger than, than any single protest uh, against nuclear weapons. But nonetheless, the, um, the others were, were smaller uh, for the most part, and uh, they didn't last as long, um, and the organization wasn't as powerful in, in, in terms of people joining groups and paying dues and uh, um, uh, forming a long-term structure. So they were often one-shot demonstrations. Uh, and, and while peace groups grew somewhat during that period, um, they didn't grow as uh, uh, dramatically as they grew during the 1980s. So, so in a way, I, I think we might say that uh, the prospect of nuclear war is perhaps the uh, the most powerful spur for people to join the peace movement. Uh, it's the peace movement's strongest argument uh, against war, uh, since that, that threatens to destroy the whole world, while uh, if you're only uh, talking about Iraq being destroyed, fewer people care about it, unfortunately. Yes. Yeah. Uh, well, um, as uh, critical a as I am of what Eisenhower called the military-industrial in complex, this uh, profit-making based on the uh, the military, uh, corporations uh, feeding uh, as uh, defense contractors or, as they were called during the 1930s, uh, merchants of death. Uh, the, as uh, critical as I am of that, I, I have to concede that there are also uh, interests within the public sector that benefit from uh, nuclear weapons. For example, uh, the weapons labs. And they lobby uh, ferociously and are lobbying uh, ferociously. In, in, in terms of this uh, nuclear posture review. That is, they don't want to give up nuclear weapons. Uh, they don't want to give up their jobs. They don't want to give up their power and their buildings and, and so on. So there are, there are private forces that are uh, pushing uh, for militarism, and there are, are, are public forces, th uh, those with an economic stake in it. So yeah. Oh, yes. Okay, so. Well, I just want to, so. What, what should be done about that? Yeah. I'm asking yeah. you as a public. Oh, well, it's, it's hard to say. I think the, the crack is nuclear weapons themselves, given the fact that such a large percentage of the public in the United States and around the world loathes nuclear weapons, thinks nuclear war is, is just crazy at this point. Notice the, the name uh, chosen, the National Committee for Sane Nuclear Policy, and so on. Uh, so the, the, the public thinks nuclear war is in, in, insane. Uh, and uh, I, I, I think, therefore, pressing on that point, saying not just that nuclear war is insane, but in terms of any war, there's a prospect for the escalation of that war into nuclear war, is a very powerful tool for the peace movement, and, and, and has been uh, since the Second World War, since the atomic bombing. Uh, and therefore, um, when the uh, NPT Review Conference uh, meets and the, the issue is raised w once more, of what are the nuclear powers doing to get rid of their nuclear weapons, which is part of the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty, I, I, I think um, uh, people who are, are concerned should hammer the, the point home that what should be done is to get rid of them and uh, create a nuclear-free world. And the, and the public likes that. So I would hammer away at that. Well, all right. Um, I think uh, it was the right time, and it was also a, a brilliant idea. Uh, the right time because um, what it seemed to be uh, an end to the Cold War uh, suddenly uh, moved into Cold War II at that point uh, with Thatcher in, in, in Britain and Reagan in the United States and, and threats suddenly flying back and forth about nuclear war. The, the, the public was shocked by uh, this sort of thing and it, it, it was made to order for mobilization uh, for the peace movement. Uh, Reagan was the best uh, recruiter for the anti-nuclear movement uh, around. Uh, um, secondly, though, uh, I think that uh, Forsberg's idea of a nuclear freeze was very good. Uh, 
uh, on two levels. One was that um, uh, she was looking for something very simple that people could deal with, uh, not stopping this missile which can do this thing and so on and then throw weights and all sorts of technical stuff and so on that the public couldn't follow, but something very simple, just stop it. Just stop it right here. No more. Just stay where you are now. If, if, if we're safe now, let's just stay safe uh, and uh, stop the arms race, freeze the arms race. People could un understand that. They, they knew there were tens of thousands of nuclear weapons out there. Why did they need more? Uh, and, and when uh, Forsberg was asked about this on, on uh, television, uh, she uh, simply said, well, the, the public knows that enough is enough. Right? Very simple thing. Um, secondly, though, it, it was a good uh, idea thanks to the fact that uh, she recognized, as she told me during a uh, lengthy interview, that um, uh, peace groups, th there were many peace groups in the United States, and each of them was going it, its own way with its own program and, and so on. So they were, they were talking about uh, cutting military spending, stopping this missile program, uh, 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 stopping this war. Uh, dealing with war orphans, a whole range of other things like, like that, uh, resisting the draft and, and so on. Uh, although I guess they weren't doing it by the, at that point. But, yeah, right. Uh, but, but, yeah, all right, uh, registration. So uh, she said, look, um, the, the whole is, is here is not the sum of all, all its parts because you're all going uh, in different directions. So why don't we get together around one simple idea, right? Well, we will all focus on stop the arms race. Just stop it now. And uh, there was general agreement. Now, some, some groups weren't so pleased with it. Uh, some of the more militants, such as the War Resistance League, felt that didn't go far enough. The freeze was too shallow. Had to get rid of war and so on and so on. Uh, and maybe it was too shallow. But in any case, it, it was a very useful mobilization tactic because for, for the most part, peace groups focused on one thing. And when they got together, they were much more powerful than when they went their separate ways. Well, I think a number of reasons. All right. Uh, Iran is um, uh, a, a country the United States has been at loggerheads with for, for decades now. Uh, so there are very bad feelings. And in that way, uh, it's viewed as an enemy country, right? And friendly countries, uh, from the U.S. government standpoint or other government standpoint, are fine having nuclear weapons and, and so on. Uh, Israel, it's fine, it's a friend of the United States and so on, but Iran is, is a foe and, and, and therefore the attempt is to uh, stop it. That's one point. Secondly, um, it, it, it seems to me that Iran is a, a country that um, uh, has, has oil resources, vast oil resources and so on. It's a valuable country uh, and uh, the U.S. government um, would, would like to get back in there and uh, purchase oil and, and uh, not be threatened with the possibility of having the oil spigot shut off. Uh, so uh, uh, the whole Middle East and, and what used to be known as the Near East, which, which is uh, Iran, um, is a region of, of such vast resources um, that the U.S. government is, is uh, worried about uh, one oil-rich country getting the bomb, especially an un un unfriendly oil-rich country, and especially a country that might throw its weight around in that region, as it has uh, traditionally. Uh, and um, uh, furthermore, it, just as a practical matter, uh, if the Iranians do build nuclear weapons, it's quite possible that other Middle Eastern countries will do the same. That is, it's, it's going to open the floodgates to uh, proliferation in that, that region. So I think uh, it's a worthy goal to stop the Iranians uh, from uh, developing nuclear weapons, not necessarily through force, but it's worth uh, trying to do it through uh, diplomacy. Uh, and it's worth trying to do it with any nation uh, developing nuclear weapons. And it's worth uh, trying to get uh, nuclear powers to get rid of their nuclear weapons, uh, since nuclear weapons anywhere are a great danger. Hmm? No, of, of course, all nations. Oh. My original question started out about civilian nuclear energy. Oh, all right. Because I think there are other countries that are busy building their own nuclear power plants. And oh, of course. You know, all, all around the world, there are, there are countries building nuclear and, and power plants. They're busy selling them. The Chinese are busy selling them. And I don't think yeah. the Russians are selling them. They yeah. Right now, yeah. Uh, the United States, in, in, in fact, 
was uh, promoting uh, nuclear power in Iran during the, uh, the years of the Shah, for example. Uh, it's just that this government is, is, is viewed as much uh, less friendly than in the Shah's government that the United States is uh, turning on it at this point. Well, can I ask yeah. something? Well, I think they're, you know, uh, they're ambivalent. Uh, I think, um, uh, like, like most people, they, they manage to harbor uh, contradictory impulses in, in, in their lives. Uh, and, and so on, on the one hand, they, they view themselves as guardians of their country's national uh, security and, and uh, responsible for being strong presidents and, and uh, prime ministers and so on. And on the other hand, they, they recognize somewhere in the back of their brain that this is dangerous stuff and that uh, if nuclear war takes, takes place, it, it can have uh, catastrophic, in fact, will have catastrophic consequences. And so um, they're not... Um, totally resolved in, in, in terms of, of, of what follows from that. Uh, they're not quite sure what to do in, in those circumstances. And un unfortunately, <coughs> wars and international conflicts tend to bring out the worst in them. Um, let me add something else, though, um, that we haven't talked about, uh, but I think is worth considering. And, and that is, since nuclear weapons are so linked to warfare and to conflict among nation states, uh, simply uh, the latest, most powerful weapons uh, to be used. Um, it seems to me we, we also have to be talking about a uh, cure for warfare, something that will make warfare less likely and thus uh, nuclear weapons uh, less desirable. And it, it, it seems to me um, that we need uh, the development of global institutions that can uh, resolve conflicts among nation states, uh, either uh, before war, war breaks out or after it does. Uh, and after the First World War, uh, in, indeed even during the First World War, uh, that was the League of Nations. In, in, in increasingly, um, the public and, and policymakers were starting to, to think about transcending uh, national sovereignty by uh, developing some kind of international organization uh, that could uh, prevent war uh, and uh, provide for international security. Um, but in, in the end, again, of, of two minds about this, should we just build the biggest and best, wep uh, best weapons, or uh, should we grant some of our sovereignty to this international body? They, they backed away from granting sovereignty, and, and they turned to more arms races during the 1920s and 1930s, a and the League was uh, crippled, therefore. Uh, the United States, in, in fact, never even joined the League. Um, the Second World War, the, the, the most devastating war in, in world history, led to the uh, creation of the United Nations and again a, a, a renewed sense that uh, something ha had to be done to uh, prevent World War III uh, and future conflict and that, that meant curbing national sovereignty. Uh, and the UN w was another uh, attempt uh, to move forward along those lines. Uh, but once again, the Cold War and other uh, developments showed that uh, the UN was not the favored course of, of action by the great powers to, to deal with their problems. They uh, preferred arming uh, and waging wars. Uh, so the UN was kept weak, deliberately so. Uh, and uh, it, it seems to me today that the peace movement should be calling for a more powerful United Nations, a United Nations that can restrain nations uh, uh, from waging war uh, that can enforce nuclear disarmament around the world, uh, that can um, uh, lead to that more uh, peaceful world where no president or no uh, prime minister can, can simply say, well, this serves our interests and if other nations don't like it, too bad about them, we're going to war, which was uh, pretty much what George Bush said. Uh, so uh, I think that the antidote to nationalism that has always led to wars in the past is to develop that, that kind of international or even transnational body that can uh, restrain nations from waging war. And along the way, uh, as the United Nations is supposed to do, uh, provide the, um, the social justice and the economic uh, development um, that will be the, the basis for a peaceful world. And, I, and uh, when uh, this nation was moving toward the Iraq war, it, it was very striking how a coalition developed between uh, peace activists and the United Nations, right? Uh, the U.S. failed to get the U.N. on, on its side, 
uh, uh, much to uh, Bush's uh, chagrin. And many activists turned to the UN in, in the hope that it would stop Bush. So I see that as a, a conflict, or as a, I'm sorry, as a coalition for the future, uh, where the grassroots, the activists at the bottom, are joined by an international institution at the top, and the nation state is in between, and, and like a Venus flytrap or some kind of trap, grabs that nation and says, they're not going to do it. Sorry. Rethink that war. Yes. Uh, well, I think uh, clearly uh, uh, one force for war and uh, a force for uh, support of nuclear war uh, has been uh, religious fanatics. Uh, those who, who believe that since God is on, on their side, uh, whatever they do uh, is, is uh, manifesting God's will. Um, but it, it doesn't have to go in, in that way. Uh, uh, Ronald Reagan, for example, was a, 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 a fundamentalist uh, who believed in the book of Revelation and so on and how that, that uh, prophesied uh, nuclear war. Uh, and yet, uh, he was willing to turn against nuclear war and nuclear weapons. Uh, maybe he had a, a, a different side of him, I, I don't know. But he, he, again, he, he did it in the context of popular pressure. And, and with polls showing what they do about the overwhelming opposition to nuclear war and the desire for a nuclear-free world, I think even many uh, fundamentalists, uh, both uh, Christian fundamentalists in the United States or uh, Islamic fundamentalists in other lands or, or, uh, um, or um, uh, fundamentalists in, in, in India and so on, uh, are, are, are not so keen on nuclear war as we might think. Uh, and I think that we can reach them, but we have to do that in an intelligent way and convince them uh, it's not in their interest or the world's interest or even if they believe in God and God's interest to uh, destroy the human race. So I, I, I was asked to wrap things up at this point, so I'm going to do that. Uh, thank you for coming. Uh, it, it's delightful uh, to meet all these people around the, the country and around the world, since I've also traveled around the world, who are concerned about the nuclear arms race, who are concerned about war, and, and have the uh, potential to bring those things to an end. Thank you. Thank you.